Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for putting things together into this wonderful <coughs> symposium first. And I agree that there are so many opportunities we have to understand and improve cities in the midst of this big data. We have to measure and, and we have to organize things. And this is, and this is the idea of my, uh, my talks, piercing through my talk, and how do, especially on how do mathematicians or physicists, as I am, I'm from physics, utilize data to understand cities. So once you, have, once you measure up, why do we measure up cities and how we can go about to understand cities in more scientific way. And I'm going to, I'm going to because of the limit of the time, I'm going to lay out some taste, uh, taste uh, plate, plate menu to, un, uh, to understand, browse through what kind of research, uh, research have been done. So how we understand cities, or to begin with, why do they matter to us, especially for natural scientists? Yes, we know, majority of us, we, we've seen that majority of us live in cities, and this number has been and will be increasing faster and faster. And it seems like that cities are going to future of our, I mean, <clears throat> the future. And we have to understand city, urbanize, what it means by urbanization to understand our future and prepare for our future better. To be honest, however, for us natural sciences, we actually care less about practical issue. We actually, uh, the driving force for us to study cities is more to do with uh, intellectual curiosity. In fact, cities are indeed very, very interesting scientific subject. It's like a group of bunch of people acting like almost uh, a complex organism also, within which people's interacting each other and interconnected. And curiously, curiously enough, this set of bunch of people interactions generate problems, because you, you know, increasing density and all, and create solution to the problem, and then to, on top of this problem and create another solution uh, to problems, uh, solution and the problems and solution and the problem and it's the evolution of the cities and this complicates all this complicated behavior actually gives rise to some emergent simple macroscopic emergent uh, emergent patterns so what I mean by emergent patterns so these are some examples of emergent patterns in nature so on the right, thousands, of, um, thousands to million termites make this huge, um, make this huge structure, um, <clears throat> huge structured mound on, um, uh, with absolutely no central order from the queen. So they all organize by themselves by local and ad hoc rules. And this beautiful snowflakes are also made out of. Um, microscopical dynamics of water molecules. And this basak is also, uh, has these columns, the rag quite regular columns, but they are made out of this uh, sim uh, the complicated lava flow and contractual uh, joints or fractures form. These previous, um, previous emergencies occur from out of nowhere, like they just you know, bump in together, and then somehow we saw some structure. And the, but the, these structures are very basic as opposed to cities, which are extremely more complicated. Because humans are complicated, and cities are a bunch of humans, more complicated. So I'm going to browse four examples of the emergencies in urban area, including my current research. And, and the, uh, the, oh, I, I think it should have been erased. So, the first thing uh, is the size distribution of cities. Let's see. When we measure population, we know we can measure population, although it may not be perfect for some, some cities. Uh, we measure populations of cities and then lay out them their, their, in their rank size. And then, curiously, then we find some patterns emerge. Curiously enough, we find this layout followed exactly the fo same form for every city. It doesn't matter whether it's US, whether China, India, and European cities. And this form tells you that 
the, what this form tells you is a rank R, so it's ranked by the city uh, a population, and y-axis is, is, is the population, and this is rank. So this tells you the first largest city, R equal 1, is double of the second largest city, R equal rank 2, R equal 2, so it's a half, one of half, and R3, so th th uh, th um, a third, so it's a three, three times the first rank of the city is three times larger than the, and then, and then the, the, the uh, third, and the fourth, and, and uh, fifth. So this is a simple equation. You, you just emerge out of nowhere. And all, it seems like at all cities follow this strange universal curve as long as they are inside of one country. So, but... If we, we also find, um, I think UCL, Michael Batty's group, claims that cities of no coherent power together, like a series of e, cities of EU countries, don't follow this curve. So you can now understand the coherence behavior out of this law. The next example is scaling effect. It's a kind of, nowadays, it's kind of fashionable, famous urban scaling. When we now measure cities' population and then put their one side and their corresponding socioeconomic quantities like a crimes, number of crimes or GDP, they all follow the simple power law relation. Y goes with N to the beta. Y is a crime, GDP, income, number of patterns. And this exponent beta is, is remarkably consistent across various socioeconomic quantities uh, like here. And beta is a very similar. Beta is a, is, a, is a slope of this line here in the plot. And it seems like very consistent across different measures, in different quantities. And this behavior seems to hold for many countries too, indicating the, um, the, there, are, there seems like there are some common underlying universal dynamics at play for various quantities in, in urban dynamics. And uh, I would like to note that uh, the beta is larger than one means um, larger cities have more, mo have more productivity and creativity per capita basis in a systematic way. Now, so next to the how people live in a cluster. So when we measure where people live and lay out data on the map, and regardless you know, of who are they, we just you know, plot, plot them in the picture, then it looks like they, are, they form the cluster of the fractal distribution. And the, the way fractality holds seems to look alike across other cities and other times. And, and, and this is kind of curious why we find this structure over and over again. And some, some are deviated, and once again, some are not. And that's the research question, scientific research question we want to ask. And one of the answers we are trying to tackle is we may optimize ourselves, our infrastructure, the way we live, to save our infrastructure, and like our blood vessels in my body, or the leaves uh, leaf in, a, in a tree, or the lung in our body too, so which where you also observe fractal structure. So lastly, this is this comes to my recent work. Um, <clears throat> How we look at the, how we organize our economic activities. I'm going to elaborate a bit because this is my recent work. So cities are not only about their big population size, we know, high density. Yes, but we also have our diversity. We, we talked about it. In big city, we normally see so many different cultures, so many different ideas, so many different events like this, and so many different shops. So I would like to, I, I, I look at whether there emerge orders of diversity too out of our socioeconomic activities in urban area. I'm looking at cities in US now as an ecosystem where many different species are interdependent and co-evolve. And fortunately, I was lucky to have this data where each workplace in USA is classified somewhat like uh, biological species as I think Laura just mentioned this, this is the trees. So you have the, uh, uh, the hierarchical structure, you bloom and you have different rubbers and you know, go to the, like a species of uh, phylogenetic, not phylogenetic, uh, the linear trees. And you have restaurants um, 
and rest, uh, lawyers' offices, medical centers, and restaurants can be further classified into full services restaurants and self service or you know, no service, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> So then we look at their abundances of cities, so these species in, in, in cities, you know, ecosystem. How many workplaces of each kind in active in, in the city? And here are some data of four selected cities. And here's San Jose, Phoenix, Chicago, New York. And they have different heights because of their different uh, size. So New York has more things. And the colors denote their sectors, so agriculture, mining, utilities, and restaurant, and so on. And it's interesting to look at, at how different cities have different colors arrangement, as you can see. So it is true, like a city has their own colors. You know, let's look at the New York, which has the physicians, offices of vision, number one, and the offices of lawyers, number two, and restaurants in the black, number three. In Chicago, you see restaurant and offices of lawyers. And the Phoenix here, you see the restaurant first, and then real estate. So Phoenix is the it's a Sun Belt area. It's a, the rapid expanding uh, Sun Belt city. So it's it's not surprising, but it's kind of interesting to look at that. And San Jose is the place in the U, um, in U.S. is the place where Silicon Valley sits in, and you see a lot of computer program services uh, exhibit. And uh, but. Uh, yeah, and you see some consistencies. Restaurants are kind of number one rank. So it seems like a lawyers, programmers, uh, doctors, we all have to eat. Yes. As, but nevertheless, if I, you know, as physicists, I would like to ignore all different kind of things first to look at whether we have some emergent behavior. So we, I just erase all the colors. I just look at the shape, and we see the very similar shape for different cities. And we, uh, as we would like to think about uh, whether we want to know whether we have some universal shape, so we normalize by the population size because you know, it's not fair to compare the New York with San Jose. So we normalize with the population size. We only have distribution. Then we, we have a single one shape, universal shape distribution, which has the information of this distribution of economic activity across all cities. So a gray area, you don't see much because they are on top of each other. They are all 360 US cities, and they somehow collapse to on, on a, one to, on to another. And you also see Detroit follow the same line with New York or San Jose. This is kind of interesting, and uh, it seems like there is a, the common mechanism of economic activities encompassing all different characteristics of an urban area. And they, then, then in that case, we can make a model out of this and we can understand what kind of fundamental dynamics generate such you know, consistent behavior across all cities. But on the other hand, I'm just curious then what makes big cities different from small cities because they are the same. Why big cities, in, why big cities make more money? We know big cities make more money in general, than small cities, and how we can reconcile this idea, the previous emergence, you know this economy of scale in the previous slide, and then we have this, and how we can reconcile different pictures. Then I realized this stochastic model cannot tell you about this economic productivity, increasing productivity. What makes cities great, or they, they produ more productive or wealthier, is the composition the colors actually as it is, like what kind of colors fill in to their universal shape like this. I'm coming back to the more detailed picture now. So now look at the individual sectors and scale with the population size. So I, I take one individual uh, sector, like a lawyer's offices, here is lawyer's offices, and try to see how they scale with the population size. And remember the scaling exponent I just mentioned, I briefly mentioned? Better is greater than one. That means we have more lawyers' offices per capita basis in larger cities. So when your city is larger, we have more lawyers for some reason. And uh, this exponent is very curious. And, and, and then that means we have more lawyers' offices. Something, something got to change. Something is losing out. Who are losing out? So let's, before going that, uh, so we, if we rank the lowest offices in the larger city, the y-axis is a population. So in the larger population, you have 
the rank, y-axis is rank. So you have uh, the higher rank for the lawyer's offices in the small cities. Then, now you can see what are missing. So we did the same thing for all industrial sectors. And we have a lot of, uh, uh, not reading much, but uh, the x-axis is a scaling exponent, y-axis is frequencies, um, or we can just you know, point out who are they. And uh, one is, one means, as I said, scales with the size, the restaurant. So we, everyone has to go to, re I guess, restaurant frequently. So restaurant is actually around one, education, one. Some public sectors are one, so we go together. It doesn't matter with the cities. It doesn't matter if it's a big or small cities, we all need. But mining, utility, or fishing, farming, are actually shrinking when you increase the size of cities. And this shrinking, so you have some rooms to fill, are filled by, uh, let me see what's, management of companies and enterprises, the, these sectors, and professional, scientific, technological services. They are the sectors, super linear here, and they fill in the, the empty place that are emptied by, uh, by fishing. So this, th this is a kind of basic compositional, economic compositional change for syst systematic change of the cities when, when they become larger and larger. Okay, now it's the, it's the conclusion. As we have seen, there are some universal patterns in various urban dynamics, which can be expressed in math mathematics. This allows us to make a scientific model of cities, I believe, and not, not only for a specific city, but also for the general urban dynamics, from which we may have some long-term predictive power, I hope. And these attempts are all require a good empirical data we have to measure up. And of course, we are still a long way to go, I, I think. Uh, but I think this is a good start. Thank you.